You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey Vet Rehabbers, with the Vet Rehab Summit fast approaching, we thought we would chat about one of the ways we are leveling up. Now this year's Vet Rehab Summit is happening on the 12th of November. We're taking a little different approach this year. Our theme is excellence. Excellence about perfection and growth above striving. Now we are looking at some more self-mastery topics and we'll be tackling things like increasing our credibility, how to show our excellence, increasing our confidence, how to handle criticism so it doesn't affect our mindset, and how we can use public relations to help us show our excellence. Now, online Pet Health members, you get free VIP access to the day. If you're not a member, you have two choices. You can either join our membership, our prices range from $57 to $77 a month, or you can purchase day access to the event, and it's $297. You can find out more at vetrehabsummit.com. Now, today, Anne and I speak about how to build credibility in the field of vet rehab, why it's so important for you as a practitioner, as well as for the vet rehab profession, as well as also giving you some easy tips and advice on ways in which you can instantly increase your credibility. Before we head over to that chat, a quick word from our sponsors. Choosing the right therapy laser and PMF systems for your practice are big decisions, and that's why Response System has been helping to make that decision easier for over 35 years. By offering Class 3B and Class 4 lasers, as well as a full line of PEMF products designed for both small animals and horses. All of the systems are fully rechargeable and adapted to international grids. You can find out more at responsesystem.com. You can also come and chat to Response System at our Vet Rehab Summit. Don't forget, it's the 12th of November. It's in 10 days time, guys. I think you guys are going to enjoy this one. Hey, Anne, Thank you so much for joining me again. I love it when you and I do podcasts together. Hi, Meg. It's great to be here with you. So do I. It's always really good to chat about this stuff with you. Yeah. So today we're going to be talking about how to build credibility in our field. And I think it's something that not all of us think about, right? Sometimes it just happens to us. We, you know, we get that credibility, but, but I think that having a bit of a plan around building credibility, I think is important. So we're going to do what we did the last podcast, where you're going to interview me, right? Definitely, and I'm looking okay. forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. <laughs> All right, so I think we should start with, with why is it important to build credibility? Because like you say, that's not something that many of us think about. And even if we don't have a plan, just being aware of uh, what the benefits are and why we should be thinking about it might already be enough to help us on our way. So why is it important to build credibility? Yeah, I mean, the way I see it, credibility helps us to be recognized, right, by our peers, by veterinarians, by other pet professionals. Um, and this, I think, helps in our business. I think it helps with our confidence um, because when you have credibility, you are seen as an expert, right? Somebody who knows what they're doing. And with that comes trust and people trust you, you know, and that trust in you I think helps with your confidence because people are like, okay, like she knows what she's doing, he or she. Yeah. So I think for me, you know, um, having that credibility, having that trust in you helps in so many aspects. I mean, even with, with pet parents, when a veterinarian trusts another veterinary professional, right, that comes out in the way that they speak. And that pet parent then is like, okay, well, if my vet trusts this person, then I must trust them. And I also think that if you're if you if you have credibility, so the more credible you are, I think also you have better chance of being able to communicate with people because with credibility brings that trust and then you're able to communicate better because people are more likely to listen to what you have to say. Definitely. I think what it what it also means for me is that it it opens opportunities or it creates opportunities. And I think often opportunities that we we wouldn't be able to access if we didn't have that credibility. So I think that's important as well to think about. But let's just backtrack, I think, a little bit more and go back to what is credibility. So what does that actually look like in our field? So if we say 
hey, we're going to work towards getting credibility, then, then what are we actually saying we're working towards? What does that look like when we've achieved it? So for me, credibility would be where you are in a position where people are listening to you. You have people that trust you with their pets, with their patients. You're in a confident position. Yeah, that's, I, mean, I think, pretty much what I've been talking about. Yeah. I mean, is it something different for you? I think that's, yes. I think that I was thinking more on like a global scale. So if we think about your kind of online brand um, and, and how people are aware of you in the online world, I think that's probably because of, because of what we do. That's where my mind went. But working in practice, it would be far more relevant like you said, the, the people that are around you. So more of a local credibility, although the international one, it doesn't mean that you can't have that international credibility or people knowing who you are, uh, but it's probably more relevant on a local scale. Okay. <laughs> I think more, I think what you're trying to say is like you recognize, which, yeah. which I agree. I mean, I think it starts off with being recognized in your immediate area. But then if you think about it, I mean, we have vet rehabbers that lecture and are at conferences that are recognized globally, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where it boils, it, it eventually boils down to you sort of get recognized on an international scale. So I like the way you're thinking, you're thinking big. Yeah, I'm thinking <laughs> yeah. big. No, yeah. I mean, because that, that gives you opportunities in the global markets. It means that yeah. if you want to move to Florida, you could. <laughs> You sure. could apply for, for work there and um, if they already know your name and they're already aware of what you're doing in the field, it's, it gives you that opportunity. So I'm kind of thinking of like the Carrie Adrians and Lilani Alvarez's and Matt Brunke and, you know, I feel like they have credibility. They've been around, they've done the research, we know who they are, we know what they're good at. That's what I'm thinking towards. Yeah. yeah, so I think that's the big picture, right? Yeah, but a long the, term. Yeah, so but for the smaller vet rehabber, like when I say smaller, like so, like somebody who's maybe just starting, I mean that's like a, that's like a lifelong commitment, right, to get to that level. So, so they've been working for years and years and years um, to get themselves to that level. So yes, you can strive for that, but you can have credibility even if you've been, you know practicing as a vet rehabber for one year you can start becoming credible in your field in your area so yeah don't it, don't think about that as the only sort of option of credibility there are lots of lots of ways in which you can be credible right for sure for sure okay so how would we build cred credibility we've done the what and the why so, yeah. now, <laughs> so now how do we do it so, yeah, so for me, I, I wrote down five different ways in which I think we can get credibility in our field. So the first one would be lecturing, right? You're immediately seen as an expert at something if you lecture. And I know it's so daunting to lecture, especially if it's your first time, but you have to actually just put yourself out there and do it. And once you do it once or twice, it starts to become a little bit easier. So the other ways are getting into the media, so like TV, radio, and newspaper, and, and if you have an article published, especially for pet owners, when they see you, pictures of you or talking about you in the newspaper or maybe on TV or radio, hear you talking, for them, it's exactly the same thing. They see you as the expert. And then what generally tends to happen is that they'll say, oh, to the vet, did you see that vet rehab therapist or vet physiotherapist, whatever, whatever they're doing and, and tell the story to them. And that then helps with your credibility with the vets too, because they're like, oh, wow, they're in the newspaper. And, and I don't know why. I mean, there's this perception, right? If you're in the newspaper or the TV or radio, then you must be something big because, I mean, the TV and newspaper are not going to waste their time on somebody who isn't actually an expert or some doing some big things in their field, right? So, yeah, I think that that really gives you some very quick credibility when you're, if you get into the newspaper. And then what generally tends to happen is once you're in the newspaper once, then like your, your details are there and then other newspapers and other journalists find you and then they're like, contact you and they say, oh, can we also do something on you? And then once you get their contact details, then you're in for the win because then you, whenever you have an interesting case, you contact them and you say, hey, can you, um, can you do this article on me? And then you're just in the news all the time, <laughs> putting yourself out there, it's great. 
that's brilliant. That's quite a nice snowball, I think. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you go through all five now? Not yet. No, 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 no. That's just number two, getting in the middle. So now the third one is to get published in magazines. So um, veterinary magazines, there are loads of different veterinary magazines that you can approach to write articles for, and then pet magazines or horse magazines. So writing articles, I think, is a really, really good one. And sometimes, you know, you're not going to get paid to do this. You're going to just do it for free, right? But sometimes they will say, oh, well, you can have a free advertorial or a little advert in, and that helps you promote your business. So yeah, that's, a, that's another way. Number four and is that one, you might yeah. be able to get a, a regular spot. So you might be able to have yeah. a column in, in every, you know, in every one of the, the publications of a certain magazine. So I think that's a very good, a very good way as well. If you're good at writing, then do that. Yeah, I like it. Number four is to be involved in research. Oh. So when you're doing research, you're seen as the leading part of vet rehab, the leading, you're on the leading edge, you know? So if you think about it, those people that you, you mentioned earlier, they're all people that have done research. So researchers seem to be, research gives you credibility because you're spending time learning and obviously improving our profession. And then the last one was winning awards. Now, all these suggestions that I'm obviously giving now, there are loads of other ones. These are my top ones. And I love the winning awards one because that one really does like put you in the limelight, right? I mean, we've got that IAVRPT Vet Rehab Therapist of the Year Award that's coming up very soon. I think we're going to be announcing the winner at the Vet Rehab Summit this year on the 12th of November. But I mean, even you don't even necessarily have to win. Just being nominated for award gives you credibility because of the exposure that you get from it. Um, so one thing I want to say about all five of these things. So I'm going to go through all five again. So the first one is lecturing in the field. Two is getting in the media, TV, newspaper, radio. Three is getting published in magazines. Four is being involved in research. And five is winning awards. Now, the thing with these things is that they very rarely happen to you. They more likely happen because of you. And so what we often think is that when we see other vet rehabbers winning awards and we see other vet rehabbers in the newspaper and on TV, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, they have been actively trying to get those specific things that they've got, right? So they are making contact with the journalists. They are ap applying for awards. Um, so sometimes you can nominate yourself for awards. You don't have to be nominated by somebody else. So they're putting themselves out there to create that public relations and PR around the media hype and to try and increase their credibility. So I want you guys to all remember that. It's not, it's, it's not what some, sometimes people will come to you and ask you, can, I, can you do this for me? But if you go out there and try and get it, you're more likely to get all those things. And usually once you get one, you end up doing a whole lot of the other ones because like I said, that snowball effect that happens. I love that. I love that. I love that. And I mean, if we think about the IAVRPT award, that's quite, that's quite a big one. <laughs> that's quite a big one. And that feels that's very big one. for, you know, the average person, but there are so many local things that you could, that, that you could get in for like business awards, the star awards. So just be aware of what's happening in your region and in your area for that, you know, that awards aspect that one makes me a little bit uncomfortable I have to say so if you're like me and you feel a bit uncomfortable by that go for one of the other options like lecturing <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about lecturing Meg, because you said earlier that all the, all the things that those people that I mentioned have in common is that they're in research they're all also lecturers so I think that is a very important component of this so lecturing is very valuable other than building your credibility, what other benefits does it hold for us? Yeah, I mean, for me, every time I've lectured, what's amazing is the research that you have to do. You know, if you've never lectured before, you have no idea how long it takes to create that lecture. The research that goes behind it and putting the slides together, all of that, we actually grow so much and the knowledge that you get from deciding to lecture and that's why they actually they actually give cpd points to you when you lecture 
So if you're a lecturer, you get CPD points for the time that you lecture because you're actually learning so much. So I think just for personal growth and knowledge, and I think once you start to lecture and you start to lecture quite frequently on the same topic, you actually start to grow a passion for that topic and then become sort of known as the expert, right, in that topic. And that helps with your credibility too, because people are known for certain things, right? So if you think about vet rehabbers, you know, I can think of names of people and I'll be like, oh, that person's known for that. And that person's known for that, you know, like Amy Hesback is all about neuroplasticity. Michael Yeo, like, and I think of him, I think of those rock pods, you know, the cupping, you know? So yeah, so you become known for a certain topic and that really helps because then you can really like learn and research about that specific topic and then it opens up so many doors for you and then once you are lecturing lots you get to get asked to come and lecture at different conferences which are all around the world so you have this option to travel and then you get to meet all the amazing people at all the conferences in our field and so yeah I think lecturing really opens up so many doors um, for you so on top of all the credibility just the personal growth that you have um, and the ability to be able to learn and grow and potentially add value to the vet rehab profession. I love that you're you're building value in the profession and building yeah. the credibility of the profession. I really like that. I think you're also developing your communication skills and a, a lot of personal skills because you have yeah. to overcome your fear of talking in front of people. You have to be able to control your nerves you have to be able to speak clearly and project your voice and all of those things are skills that you can practice and that you can become better at and that translate back into your work into your practice when you're communicating with clients and you're working with patients and I think that's really important to remember is that it's gonna it's going to make you a stronger communicator developer of relationships explainer and educator of the problems that that the patients are facing and that's really that's really valuable to me when I think about the benefits then those ones really stand out for me so let's talk a little bit about research (laughs) also Mm. one of my favorite topics so if we think about research and clinical trials they can massively increase our, our credibility and they benefit our profession. So the same thing, we're building up our profession. Let's talk about how vet rehabbers can actually be involved in research. Yeah, so do you remember, I think it was like two years ago at the Vet Rehab Summit, we had our topic, which was research versus reality. And that was a great year because Kiki Hausler created that research working group. So if you're interested in that, I would really, really recommend joining the working group. We'll put all the links for the, for what we're chatting about now in the description of the podcast. So yeah, just joining a working group and finding people that are, have similar interests to you. And you might be able to find you know, something that you work together with people on that group. I think also getting some knowledge and um, just improving your your knowledge around research. And so Chris Zink from Canine Rehab Institute has got an amazing online course. And I think it is how to introduce clinical research into your clinic. Let me try and see, but introduction to veterinary clinical research, that's what it's called. Yeah, by Chris Zink. And um, you can go check that out. We'll um, put the, the link for that in the description too. Because I think, you know, if if I think about my studies, we never really were taught how to do research, you know. So it's quite daunting. When you think about research, we think, I mean, I certainly do. I feel daunted. I feel daunted by doing everything right, all the statistics and all those kind of things. But it doesn't have to be that complicated. I think doing a course like that is really, really great if if you are serious about it. And then we've actually got a lecture by Chris Singh too. She did a lecture at that Vet Rehab Summit, which is in the online Pet Health Members Portal on um, clinical research. And then there's also another great one, that one, that lecture by Lalani Alvarez and Kevin Hausler on interpreting research. And I mean, that was really, really, really interesting for me. And there was a, they lectured that together. So that's another learning that I would suggest um, one should do if you're interested. Definitely. That one really helped you read a research article efficiently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and at the same time going, hey, is this worth my time or not? So really the the strength or the value or the credibility of that paper. So that one was called Research versus reality, I think, yeah. by, 
by Lelani Alvarez and Kevin Hausler. If, you, if you're an online Pet Health member, if you go into the members portal and you go to Vet Rehab Summit, it'll be under the 2020 Vet Rehab Summit. So all the Vet Rehab Summit recordings are all there. I actually went in there the other day and I was like, wow, I can't believe how many recordings, just the Vet Rehab Summit recordings. That's not even the webinars yeah. on our platform, just the Vet Rehab Summits. There's some amazing, Great. amazing pictures there. And of course, what's nice is that we've got some topics, right? So just like really getting a hold of a specific topic. So I like Pet Health members go and check that out. I agree. I love it. And I think that, you know, if you're considering doing research in clinical practice and using kind of your patient load and the, the, the patients that you're already seeing, I think that retrospective studies do have their limitations, but they also have their value. And it's a good reflection of what actually happens in clinical practice, right? A lot of research trials or scenarios are set up in the ideal in the ideal scenario. And that's great for research purposes. But when we're looking at clinical work, there are, there's, also, there's always life. There's always life. So I love retrospective studies in that they reflect life and they reflect what's actually happening. And to be able to do that, all you need is to be using reliable outcome measures every day with every patient that you see. So it, it, if you guys have been following us for a while, you'll know that we talk about outcome measures often. And there are so many ways that we can bring validated outcome measures into our practice without making our lives more complicated, right? Things like clinical metrology instruments, that's big, but it basically is um, questionnaire-based forms that you're filling in. So the canine brief pain inventory, Cody, which is a very personalized one. I really like that one. And there are a few others that have been validated. Uh, the Helsinki one, there are a few. We have a blog that have all of them listed there with all the links to get them. Just including that in your practice already is going to give you a, an outcome measure that's been validated already in the research and that you're going to bring into a practice that's going to add value to your patients. It's going to add value to, every, to your clients because they'll see the change over time and you're going to be able to use that when you speak to vets. So you have that benefit already and being able to look at your patient outcomes and publish that as research in the future. So um, just do that. Start with that. If it feels daunting and intimidating, start with that would be my kind of suggestion. Then the next thing I want to talk about, Meg, is how we communicate. Because mm. I think that that is a big part as well about, or that's a big part of whether or not we come forth as credible or not credible just in our conversations with people and how we portray ourselves on social media because it's really easy <laughs> for us to say in a social media post or when we're talking to an owner that when you swim this dog we're going to increase the elbow range of motion yes and we can say that and that's been proven and validated so we can say hey you're going to increase the elbow range of motion but what if we're also saying and you're going to increase spinal mobility. Well, that hasn't been proven. That hasn't been validated. So probably yes. And we can see that when we're looking at the patients. But how we say that and how we communicate that will either make us more credible or less credible to the person that's listening to us. Because immediately they'll have a flag go up and say, whoa, really? 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 <laughs> and I'm sure you've felt that before, right? When you're listening to someone and they're making claim, 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 this is going to do that. And this is going to do that. Then you have immediate flags go up and say, really now? Whereas if they communicated it differently and they said, hey, probably what we can see when we swim a patient is that this is happening to the spine. So we assume that we're going to have that effect. Or the research shows that we increase elbow flexion, so we are likely to also X, Y, Z, then it makes it easier for them to see you as credible. So I think just really pay attention to how you put things forward and how you communicate information, um, whether it's fact or anecdotal or probable. <laughs> we're guessing yeah. and this is the outcome we're hoping for and how do we measure that that's important yeah and I think it also is so important that and this is why knowledge is so important right mm -hmm. because if you know exactly what is evidence-based and what isn't 
then you're able to actually state those claims. And then you're not going to be saying things that are not actually true. And I think it's just in the communication, you need to always be honest, you know, and if I think about it, you know, how often do you hear our top lecturers lecturing and they will say, you know, this is something, but we don't know the answer to that. You know, we're trying to find the answer, but they, they just really transparent with everything. You know, they say what they know and they will say what they don't, you know, and that's okay. Because sometimes I think that we can be scared to not know something, but you mustn't be really, because I, you know, even those people who we're chatting about now, who we're talking about as highly credible people in our field always and often will say we don't I don't know the answer to that we don't know that because there are a lot of things that we don't know so just being really clear with your communication being okay to say things that you know and that you don't know and and then if you if there is no evidence around something then you you need to say it's anecdotal you know like you say this is something that we've seen um, we don't have any clinical research around this, so we can't prove it as yet, but we do think this might be happening and we hope that we would get this benefit. Um, so yeah, I think the communication is so important and then just keeping up with your knowledge. So just know exactly what is evidence-based and what isn't. I love that. And I really like that you said, you know, you made that differentiation between our top lecturers that's that's so often a flag for me when I'm listening to a lecture when someone says that you know they're giving you so much information but they have so many more questions than answers and if you guys listen to that series of webinars on agility please help me with Ariel Ariel yeah. yeah 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 I mean five hours <laughs> she filled five hours more I think five and a half hours with research on agility and I can't even I, can't, I, can't, I don't even remember how many times she said we don't know we don't have this answer we still have this question how on earth would we prove that how would we research this you know just even with the amount of research that there is there are still way more questions than answers and that differentiates for me often a lecturer who knows their topic from one who doesn't <laughs> and who is just sharing kind of second, uh, I want to say secondhand information, but maybe that's not quite right. But their depth of knowledge and understanding of the subject is not quite that, that great. And that brings us kind of back to the Dunning-Kruger effect. If you guys have read that blog, blog or are familiar with that effect, it's essentially a cognitive bias that dictates the relationship between confidence and knowledge. And when we have a little bit of knowledge on a subject, we have a lot of confidence. <laughs> and they call that point where you have a lot of confidence and a little bit of knowledge, Mount Stupid, um, because you're very loud <laughs> and you're very confident in, in sharing your knowledge, but you actually know very little. And when you learn a little bit more, you actually drop in confidence to a very low point. And they call that the valley of despair because you really feel like, the world has ended, you know, there's so much you don't know, you don't see how you're going to get through it, you don't know how you're going to get this knowledge, it feels hopeless, it feels horrendous. And then when you start to learn and build that up, you slowly climb up the slope of enlightenment, that's what it's called, it's brilliant, until you get to the plateau of sustainability, which means you are confident, but you know how much you don't know, and you're continuing to learn. And that's, a, I, I love that description because it just, it gives you an idea of where you are on the spectrum. When you think about how much you know about a subject or how you feel about a subject, if you're overly confident and cocky, check yourself. <laughs> exactly. Just check yourself. I love that. Anyway, I love that. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. <laughs> so Meg, where can people learn more about building credibility? Where? Where? When, like when, maybe the best uh, when, when. I thought you said when, can <laughs> when, yes, yes, at the Vet We Have Summit. I'm so excited for this year's Vet We Have Summit. I, you know, I and I, for those of you that can watch the video of this, Anae has got the Vet We Have Summit t shirt on, and you can see I've got a Vet We Have this t shirt on. So, and when we started this <laughs> recording, I was like, where did you get that t shirt from? 
So I don't have one yet. So, but yeah, I am so excited. This this year's Vet Rehab Summit, I was thinking about it, you know, afterwards, you're just going to leave the Vet Rehab Summit on the 12th of November and you're going to be feeling confident. You're going to be feeling like I've got this, you know, you can have a plan for so many different things. If you are a person that is wanting to build your credibility, if you're wanting to share your excellence, if you're wanting, if you're suffering with confidence issues, if you're wanting to make sure that your knowledge that you have is diverse and that you have a plan to make sure that you don't have any knowledge gaps, this is the place for you guys to be on the 12th of November. You're going to leave there. or I know that I'm going to leave there just feeling like, well, I got this, you know, everything is sorted. I want to have a plan for everything. So yeah, we're going to be doing some things with Rachel Spencer on um, sharing your credibility. And I think everything really ties in together. All the different topics for me really, really tie in together nicely. Um, and then we've also got the think tank, which I think is going to be great too. So we've got like five different um, people coming together, talking about new and emerging trends that are happening in the vet rehab world for us to be aware of so that we can prepare ourselves. I think that's always good to be prepared. Always good to be prepared. Yeah, and I think the thing is with this kind of conference or summit, you actually have to make the decision to invest in yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And our hashtag is, hashtag is level up mm -hmm. and our theme is excellence, you know? So, but you guys, it really is about, yeah, thinking about this is now my time. I need to invest in myself. And because when you improve all these little things that we're, we're going to be talking about, your day-to-day -day in your vet rehab practice is going to be completely different. You know, sorting out all these little niggles, really. There could be a few niggles that are happening. And sometimes you're not even aware that they're happening. Um, so, yeah, I'm super, super excited. It's going to be great. I'm excited. And, I, and I, I think that when you guys go and read through the lineup for the vet rehab summit, you might be surprised because it's not clinical, <laughs> right? It's not about this tendon injury and that shoulder injury, that's not what our focus is this year for two reasons. Um, and I wanna share this with you guys because I think it's important that you understand. The first is that the clinical information is out there. You can watch those webinars in the online pet health members portal. You might've attended the IAVRPT summit. You might've attended other conferences and summits this year. So the clinical information is out there. What isn't and what we don't think about and what we don't give attention to is ourselves. And that is the part that holds us back in our businesses. It's not always our professional knowledge because we have that. We invest in that. We continue to learn. We are vet rehabbers who never stop learning. That is who we are. So that is not the problem that we have. And if that's not the problem, then what is? So this year's summit is really about answering that question. If you're struggling to level up your practice or achieve your goals or do the things that you've set out to do for yourself, why is that? We're going to help you find that reason at the summit and hopefully you will go away very motivated with the answers that you need to be able to take that next step in your life, in your business as a professional and to level up. That's the point. So I hope that makes sense now when you read the lineup and I hope that you guys are as excited as we are because I really think that those are the things that are holding you back. And just to add, we do have some clinical CPD there because we've got three recorded lectures that we just put in there for those of you that just can't cope without learning more. Uh, clinical <laughs> CPD, there are three recordings in there and they're great ones too. So go and yeah, check it cool. out. Online Pet Health members, you guys get VIP free access. If you're not an online Pet Health member, you can always become a member. I would 100% advise you to. You'll, get, you'll become a VIP free access member to the, vet, to the Vet Rehab Summit. Otherwise, you can also sign up for our free limited access pass or you can um, purchase tickets and um, day access as well as workshop access um, to those workshops on the 9th, 10th, and 11th. So the big day is 12th of November, though. That's when it's happening, and you can go to vetrehabsummit.com. I'm very excited. Thank you so much, Meg. This has been really interesting. <laughs> awesome, thanks. I think the next one, though, I'm going to be interviewing you. It's hard <laughs> on the other side, right? It's hard on the other side. <laughs> it's really hard. It's much easier for me to be. You know, maybe it's what you used to. I'm just used to <laughs> interviewing people, but it's hard. I agree. <laughs> Gotta be no, like thinking, no, thinking no. all the time. Yeah, you'll have to ask me about 
a subject that I know though. <laughs> cool, Annette. Right. Thanks so much. Thanks, Meg. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. See you guys at the Bed Rehab Summit, 12th of November. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab. For more information about continuing education for vet rehab therapists, you can go to onlinepetalk.com. I'd like to thank you for listening to this podcast and of course, thank our sponsors, Response System. They are as passionate about therapy lasers and PEMF equipment as you are about veterinary rehabilitation. They would love to answer any questions you have, so please please feel free to reach out to them at responsesystems.com or you can email lisa at responsesystems.com.